Hello guys welcome back to another video. In this video we will be looking at the top 5 saddest rock songs ever created before we start let's give a honorable mention to everybody loves by Ram. Anyway without further ado let's do this. Number 5 Tears in Heaven the story behind Eric Clapton's most emotional song, born out of a deep personal tragedy, Tears in Heaven remains the most personal song that Eric Clapton ever wrote. Back, Eric Clapton's 1992 hit Tears in Heaven was born out of unbearably sad circumstances. The song is a tribute to love's lasting powers and a lament for the death of Clapton's four-year-old son, Connor who died on March 20, 1991 when he accidentally slipped from the 53rd floor window of a New York City apartment building. It was so painfully personal. Clapton, who was elsewhere in New York when the tragedy happened, had the horrific task of making the identification at Lenox Hill Hospital's mortuary. I remember looking at his beautiful face in repose and thinking, this isn't my son. It looks a bit like him, but he's gone. The former Cream star said later, the world-famous guitarist and his Italian actress girlfriend, Lori Del Santo, flew their son's body back to England to be buried at Clapton's hometown church, St. Mary Magdalene, in Ripley, Surrey. The mourners included Phil Collins. Prince Charles sent a letter of condolence, though Clapton was unable to focus on music for some time. He eventually started strumming on a small Spanish guitar to ease his pain. As he thought about his son, the melody of Jimmy Cliff's Many Rivers to Cross was floating around his mind. The melody came back to him when U.S. director Lily Feeney Senek offered him the chance to write a song for an action film called Rush, which starred Jennifer Jason Lee and Jason Patrick as undercover narcotic cops. Clapton played Zanuck a few chords of the melody that had stuck in his mind. What I heard was Eric sitting in his hotel room and saying, Hey if you don't like this, I've got plenty more, Zanuck later told Newsweek. Then he began playing Tears and having a broken bar. It was so painfully personal, so obviously about the son that he lost, I wondered if it would work in the movie. At the time Clapton had written only one initial verse, Would you hold my hand? If I saw you in heaven? And he asked Will Jennings to write additional verses and a bridge. Jennings, who feared that the song was too maudlin to be a hit, was a skilled movie wordsmith, having already written the lyrics for Up Where We Belong, from An Officer and a Gentleman, and My Heart Will Go On, from Titanic. He eventually agreed to complete the song. Number 4. Heard Johnny Cash Though some songs originate with certain artists. They are really owned by different ones. For example, I Will Always Love You was written by Dolly Parton but it's become a Whitney Houston song. Even Parton, herself, acknowledges this. Another great example of this phenomenon is Hurt. Originally written by Trent Reznor and Nine Inch Nails, the song is much more considered, these days, a Johnny Cash number. Let's dive into why. Origins, Self Harm. Originally written for Nine Inch Nails second LP. The Downward Spiral, 1994, Hurt was written by Reznor and was released officially as a single on April 17, 1995. The song later went on to receive a Grammy nomination for Best Rock Song the following year. Hurt includes references to self-harm and drug addiction. Some believe the track is ultimately a sonic suicide note while others argue that it describes the flickers of hope one might feel amidst severe bouts of depression and sadness. Lyrics. To begin the song, Reznor whisper sings, I hurt myself today to see if I still feel I focus on the pain the only thing that's real. Number 3 How to Disaper a Completal by Radiohead It has been well documented that there are two main inspirations directly behind the lyrics of How to Disappear Completely. A as far as the first verse goes, Tom York had a dream where, a according to his own words, he was helplessly floating down the Liffey River and flying around Dublin. A then concerning the chorus, where the vocalist asserts that he's not here even though he is, that sentiment came to him via Michael Stipe, whom some readers would instantly recognize as the frontman of another rock band, R.E.M.A. And what it suggests, most simply put, is shutting oneself off from the outside world when feeling overly stressed. Now what actually lies at the foundation of all of these feelings is what was, in reality, 
Tom's adverse reaction to making it big. Initially A as with most of us it can be said A York was under the impression that becoming a celebrity would edify his life. But upon actually blowing up, York discovered that celebrate Kia had the opposite effect on him personally. A. That then brings us to the title and what can be deemed the central theme of this piece. The name of this track was derived from a similarly titled book. A and said text is literally about disappearing, that is dropping off the face of the earth as you are and a taking on a new identity. So combining all of these ideas with the lyrics, which themselves are pretty simple. The thesis sentiment that comes forth is pretty straightforward. Data the vocalist is an individual who sometimes fantasizes about falling off the grid, as some would say. A. In other words, it can be reasonably postulated that he's somehow depressed or perturbed, but it isn't such that he wants to harm himself or anything like that. A. Instead, in a roundabout way, what Tom is basically doing is expressing a desire to effectively get away from it all. Number 2 Something in the Way Never Know Kurt Cobain wrote something in the way about his life. He talks about living under a bridge, which he claimed happened when he got kicked out of the house and had to live under a nearby bridge. He expresses his feelings and emotions by saying something in the way. He thought everything was in the way every time he tried to feel better. Nirvana performed this on their MTV Unplugged appearance shortly before Cobain's suicide. When recording this song, Kurt Cobain whispered his vocals so quietly that producer Butch Vig had to turn his recording levels all the way up. This song was used in the film's Jerry Maguire, 1996, Jorhead, 2005, and Twice Born, 2012, on the Nevermind album. This is the last track before the hidden song called Endless, Nameless which comes in 1351 later. It startled some folks when the music would suddenly come on again, and it made others think there was something wrong with their carousel CD players that were supposed to play the next disc in the queue. Number 1. Lazar of David Bowie His final song in the song he states Scary Monster, Lazarus, the monster and its scars. Lazar, the one who is assisted by God. It almost seems that in Lazarus, Bowie's unearthly talent wanted once again, to represent himself violently, both a scary monster covered with scars, and a greedy millionaire with the world at his feet. He seems to want to quote not the risen Lazarus, but that of a lesser known parable, whose narrative is as innovative as this song, unfolding almost entirely in the afterlife. In the Gospel of Luke, 16, 1931, we find the two characters that the White Duke would incarnate in parallel, as the maester of theater, trauma, that he was, a Lazarus that is a wounded beggar, a marginalized, suffering human monster that immediately after death is brought by angels right into the bosom of Abraham, in heaven, and at the same time the opulent antagonist who, having ignored the wounds of others, is in anguish, in danger, before divine judgment. Resuming the model of otherworldly dialogue, even Bowie brings us straight into the bosom of Abraham straight to the afterlife with a dry, striking phrase, look up here, I'm in heaven, exactly the beginning of the song, paradise immediately stained by the shadow of his scars hidden under the layer of glam, I've got scars that can't be seen, he plays with the similarities to allude to himself, between scars and scary, he has never ceased to consider himself a scary monster, but now, with his earthly clothes undressed, his mask fallen, everyone recognizes him, Everybody knows me now, and he feels in danger in the face of a definitive judgment, perhaps like the rich Apollon from the parable, look up here, man, I'm in danger.